Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to welcome you to this LinkedIn Live session on customer experience and employee experience. Which is first? Is it really a chicken and the egg situation? Most employees, when you ask them, would say, well, it's obvious. Employee experience is first. Only happy employees can create great customer experience. If you ask customers, they might say the opposite. Obviously, customer experience has to come first. Otherwise, how can you have good uh, employee experience? How can you have happy employees? So let's dig down into this very important topic and see if we can find a true cause and effect and dispel the myths that are there and uh, maybe have some new insights to walk away from. In fact, I can guarantee you will. Uh, now. The idea of uh, best place to work or great employee experience goes hand in hand. And usually, I guess, the way that we would uh, rank or uh, evaluate companies by uh, great customer experience is according to these uh, published lists of great place to work, uh, things like that. And of course, when we're talking about great customer experience, we're usually looking at ranking uh, rankings that are published about net promoter score or customer experience indexes of in, any type. Uh, or maybe there's a certain criteria that people are looking at for customer service. Great customer service rankings seem to be a little bit more um, accessible in the media compared to great customer experience rankings. But I would think that customer experience rankings are a little broader than customer service per se to include other aspects beyond post-sale service. And then when you're looking at uh, top companies in the media, they're usually talking about financial performance. And uh, you know, there are many aspects of financial performance to look at, revenue growth, earnings per share. Um, I'm going to suggest that cumulative average growth rate is maybe the best way to compare and contrast uh, best employee experience, best customer experience, and best financial performance. And you can see from the arrow at the bottom of the slide, the suggestion is that there should be a matchup of who's in the top five um, within the industry. Um, in fact, you know, the top uh, performer should actually have the best employee experience, the best customer experience, and the best perform financial ex uh, performance if we are to believe, um, you know, the, uh, the common uh, wisdom that, that people have today. And uh, I think that there's a lot of common sense in that. Uh, so let's just take a closer look at an example. So I looked at uh, the best places to work in 2021, and this is globally. And the list includes DHL Express, um, Cisco, Hilton, AbbVie, and uh, Salesforce as the top five. So when you're looking at uh, these kinds of lists, it can be a little confusing. Sometimes different lists have different uh, criteria and therefore there are different companies at that uh, top. But in any case, generally speaking, looking within an industry, so say for example, if we took uh, DHL's industry or Cisco's industry, we ought to see a fairly good uh, lineup between good experience of the employees and the customers and the investors uh, all lining up. So in the absence of uh, good uh, accessible data for B2B or some of these other industries, I chose uh, Hilton to take a look at. So in the hotel industry, we have different tiers and um, a lot of these studies show just North America or other uh, geographies. So it's hard to see the apples to apples comparison. I think that if you are um, in a company and have access to your own industry data, you may be able to parse out uh, apples to apples comparisons where you know we're really looking at imperfect data here. But you can see that Hilton does show up in uh, the best hotels for 2021. And of course, this is a tricky industry in 2021. I'll acknowledge that. And at any rate, it's good to see that there is a, uh, a, a placement in the top five uh, for Hilton in both EX and CX. 
Now, when you look at the uh, growth rate, that's also representing Hilton in the top five, but because Hilton has been acquired by Marriott, then the waters are muddied. So if you're in an industry, I, represent, I, I recommend that you uh, find the representative data uh, for geography, industry, and uh, so forth that matches apples to apples as much as possible across the best employee experience, best customer experience, and best growth rate and work from there. So I think that it's going to be quite an interesting thing to take a look at for each of you. But yet we don't quite see what is the cause and the effect just by looking at these lists. It's great to see Hilton showing up in all three columns, but did employee experience cause customer experience? Or did customer experience cause employee experience to be good? Or was it the fact that they're growing well and therefore they had the money to do the things that they wanna do in employee experience and customer experience to a greater degree than their competitors have? Well, those are some big questions. Let's see if we can uh, figure it out. One of my favorite studies was uh, reported in this book called Firms of Endearment. And in this study, the researchers went to crowded places with people like college campuses, festivals, uh, shopping malls, and so forth. And just asked people, what's your favorite brand? Which companies do you like the most? And here you can see a partial list of the top perf uh, performers in that particular study. Now, that next step that the researchers took was to compare the stock performance of these companies called the firms of endearment compared to the good to great companies. There was a book published in 2001 by Jim Collins called Good to Great, and it was uh, very much hyped in the business media. Uh, people just loved it because it showed which companies had really great uh, stock performance and therefore, you know, what kind of practices do they share? Now, the firms of endearment actually had a three to one ratio in performance compared to the good to great companies. So that really is eye opening. But even further, when you take the firms of endearment companies and compare those to the S&P 500, what we see there is that there's an eight to one ratio in performance. So the next step that the firms of endearment research team took was to find out what are the commonalities in the business practices among these firms of endearment. And I think it's so interesting that they said, it's not just a matter of balancing the interests of employees and customers, shareholders, suppliers, the community, it's a matter of actively aligning them. Now that's an interesting concept. To what extent does your company actively align the interests of employees and customers together with shareholders, community, and suppliers? Uh, I think that that is something that is not accidental, it's something that has to be done intentionally. And some companies are really blessed to have a founder that has done that maybe from the beginning, and that's quite a rarity. But the other finding that they had was these companies can somehow pay higher wages, charge lower prices, and get higher profitability. How on earth is that possible? Well, it is, obviously, they proved it. But let's take a look at some of the uh, secret to that. You know, I've been in many situations where uh, employees have been having a good time. Uh, they've had the, the radio tuned to whatever they wanted and a, the certain loudness that they wanted. They were obviously having a good time. Sometimes I, it was fine with me, but many times it wasn't. It really interfered with the reason why I went to that establishment. Um, other times, employees have been, you know, really wrapped up in their task. Um, and they have their own processes. Uh, it might be uh, employee based or it might be uh, employee specific or it might be um, a policy of the company. This is the way we've always done it or this is how I'm going to do it, which doesn't necessarily jive with my request. So in those cases, 
the customer is frustrated. And it goes beyond the customer facing people. Uh, many times the, what I hear when I'm contacting a company is, well, you're going to have to wait for this other group or we don't handle that. Um, or, you know, that was something that the such and such department did. And that tells us that the non-customer facing groups are just as much at, uh, at risk in terms of creating a poor customer experience. In fact, maybe much more than the uh, customer facing groups. Um, in fact, I believe that they, the non-customer facing groups are the crux of most customer experience uh, thorny issues. And that's a two-way street, isn't it? Because we've seen a lot of evidence in the last year, especially in the airline industry, that customers are getting not only frustrated, but sometimes enraged and acting out. And that has a consequence to employees of burning them out uh, causing fatigue, um, you know, we have the great uh, resignation underway. So it's a two-way street and it's a little bit tricky figuring out, well, what comes first? Why did why were those cust customers uh, upset so much in the first place? Did the company actually have um, some kind of responsibility, some kind of uh, cause in that particular equation? It may be, but in any case, it's really hard to feel the love um, every company wants their employees to love them. Every company wants their customers to love them. Customers just want to, you know, love their life and uh, have have ease of work and ease of doing business. So, you know, it's be, it's a tricky situation. It really is a chicken and the egg conundrum when you're looking at it that way. But very enlightening was this case study from HCL Technologies. Their CEO wrote a book. Um, about 10, 10 years ago or so, called Employees First, Customers Second. So that title intrigued me. And as I read it, I was really impressed with what they had done. Apparently, HCL Technologies had been around already, you know, for 15, 20 years by the time uh, 2000 came around. But in those early years of the 2000s, they were really struggling. Uh, they were falling behind in their industry. And so the CEO decided, you know what, we are only as successful as our, uh, you know, as our customer facing roles are allowed to, to do the right thing for our customers. And so I'm going to invert the pyramid and instruct all the middle managers and all the top managers that they are in service to the customer facing groups. And so we put in a lot of uh, measures, uh, actually uh, practices and attitudes that really uh, drove, uh, you know, uh, su high support of the customer facing groups. But throughout the whole book, he mentioned that these customer facing groups were being um, shaped and groomed in accordance with what was important to customers. And that was really the backdrop of everything. If you weren't able to adapt or uh, deliver to what was important to customers, it didn't really matter. And so everything in this pyramid was in service to what was important to customers. So I think that the title of the book is a misnomer, although it was, uh, you know, it's a very good case study and I recommend it to anybody because there's really gems of wisdom that you can pick up there. And when I first joined Applied Materials, a semiconductor equipment company, the thing that I saw in my payroll notice was your payroll dollars are provided by satisfied Applied Materials customers. That's a real reminder to everyone in the whole company, anyone who's getting a paycheck, that this inverted pyramid is really the success. Now, whether you actually manage your business, you know, with an inverted pyramid or not, really helping everybody understand that customers are the source of salaries, budgets, and dividends is a huge step forward to getting, uh, you know, the cart before the, the, the taking the cart before, you know, putting the horse before the cart and uh, putting a stop to the horse before the cart. So, uh, you know, it's interesting to see what's happening in business today in terms of what is the purpose? 
many, many years, um, I heard that the purpose of business is shareholder wealth. And I got my MBA in the 1980s. And I think that there was a tremendous amount of um, hype about company valuation, uh, stock, uh, shareholder uh, value and such. And so we kind of lost our way. But it's interesting to note that Peter Drucker, who was a management guru and very well respected in the 60, 50s, 60s, and 70s, he wrote in 1966, the purpose of a business is to create a customer. He probably said it much earlier than that. And he also said that the aim of marketing is to know and understand your customer so well that the product or service fits him and sells itself. Now let's substitute customer experience in, in the place of marketing. If the aim of customer experience management is to know and understand the customer so well that the product or service almost automatically sells and you have almost automatic customer experience excellence. That's what we're really striving toward. And that, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. I'm really um, heartened to see that in 2019, the business roundtable, which is made up of several hundred uh, CEOs, uh, they put out a proclamation about the new purpose of business. And it's really circling back to what we already knew in the 1960s that the purpose of business is to benefit customers, employees, suppliers, communities, and shareholders. I find it very interesting that they um, list these stakeholders in that order. So I wanna pause for a moment and just see some comments here. Um, I see uh, Tatiana R R Ramirez says that um, the payroll is a practice that every company should apply, reminds who's paying. Yes, because uh, when you feed the hand that feeds you, you can only be more successful. Um, we, we welcome your further comments. If you'd like to share them, we'll uh, revisit in a, in a moment. So customers, employees, and partners actually fuel a company's growth. There are no exceptions to that. You may be a, a, a nonprofit and say, well, it's our donors. Okay, but you know, at the end of the day, um, are they your customers? Uh, they may you can view them as a customer set, right? But also, the end uh, recipient of those donations must be uh, satisfied with how you are providing that uh, support. Otherwise, there's really no need for those donations. So think through um, kind of a Russian doll. Uh, uh, in, uh, scenario for who your customers are uh, so that you have a hierarchy of the different stakeholders. At any rate, what everyone has in common is realities divided by expectations and mutual growth. Our customers fund salaries and budgets and dividends. At the end of the day, other investors, bank loans need to be paid back by customer revenue. Um, our employees provide the, uh, the things that our customers need. And our partners are usually the ones who help deliver that. So at any rate, um, we need to make sure that we're not just looking at revenue growth and the market and the media, but be looking at how well we are feeding the hand that feeds us with employee experience, customer experience, and partner experience. So going back to our table of best place to work, best customer experience and best growth rate, I think that the whole key here is to really be clear about which one is a goal, which one is a reward, and which one is a means to an end. We need to be thinking about financial performance as a, a reward. Um, sorry, I've, let's see. Sorry, Tatiana, I'm trying to see how, okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah, thanks guys, I'm uh, still learning this, this uh, technology. So if we're thinking about the financial performance as a reward, um, that means that that's what we get by meeting our goal. What is our goal? Great 
customer experience because we're trying to feed the hand that feeds them, feeds us. They're the ones who provide the money that makes the world go round for all the things we need. And how do we get there? By great employee experience. So yes, you can say that it starts with employee experience and then goes to uh, customer experience and then financials. That's pretty obvious. However, there's a little more to it. What you wanna do is you want to start out with who are your high potential customers? Who are your high potential employees? And who are your high potential partners? When you decided who those people are, what type of characteristics they have, then that uh, guides your sales organization to seek out those types of high potentials. So you wanna really stack the cards in your deck. And not only are you trying to attract those, but you're actually setting up your whole way of running the business accordingly by understanding what it is they want. What is the intended outcome of why they are uh, pursuing your solution, why they're interacting with you? There's an overall intended outcome. Now that is not necessarily um, best measured by NPS or other customer experience index, uh, or, or rankings of things like that. Um, intended outcomes are what the customer is trying to get done. The, what is the employee trying to get done by being an employee? Um, what are partners trying to get done by being a partner? And when you really focus on what they're trying to get done, you will help them get that done. And therefore your rankings will be high. So that's a very important nuance that we are not really doing in common practice today. The same thing would happen for employee experience, but with a different layer. Here we're saying that the way that you hire employees should be in accordance with the intended outcome of your customers and your employees and your partners in combination, as we saw, being intentionally aligned uh, as, as, as pointed out by the firms of endearment. How you review your employees, how you develop them, how you reward them should all be in accordance with this North Star of customer experience. Because as you uh, get the right people in place and you uh, develop and reward them and review them uh, in accordance with that, then you're going to see that employees are happy it's not just a matter of setting up a daycare, bringing in uh, uh, dry cleaning services and so forth. There are many companies that do that, that don't necessarily have a great employee experience or a great customer experience or great financial. We saw that in the dot-com bubble uh, in 2001, uh, the early late 1990s in Silicon Valley, companies uh, pulled out all the stops. They had slides going from the second floor into the lobby they had uh, ping pong tables, uh, bring your pet to work, all kinds of perks for employees. It was a very competitive hiring uh, market. And uh, it was really hard to, to hold on to employees because they would you know, go to the next best offer. It was such a hyper competitive situation. But we know that that bubble burst. And so um, you know, there's many examples of where it's not just a matter of tactics. It's really a matter of strategy, as I've laid out here. Let's just put this to test for a moment. Say, for example, you want to lose weight or you just want to be healthy. Um, the reward is having a, a body mass index that is healthy for you in terms of uh, having less, um, uh, less illness, uh, less uh, uh, likelihood to get a disease, um, you know, just greater health. So you might have a longer lifetime, you might have a more enjoyable life and less costs in terms of things, uh, things going wrong, medicine and so forth. Now, the goal then would not necessarily be uh, number one, you know, high potential wellness, your goal would be, I want to have a, a, high, a weight that is commensurate with my height and my age range. I want to um, have social ease with the body that I'm in. I want to have certain physical capabilities, like be able to 
climb the stairs or, you know, go on, go to on some kind of uh, hike to, on a mountain or, you know, whatever your, your hobbies are. So that those would be the type of goals that we're talking about an intended outcome, right? <laughs> your intended outcome is, uh, is number two, whereas the reward is number one there. And so what are you going to do to get there? You're going to make sure you have the right amount of exercise, sleep, a, a really good ratio of fats, carbs, and proteins in your daily diet, and you wanna manage your stress. Any of those being out of whack can uh, wreak havoc with your fitness goals and your body, uh, body mass uh, rewards. So think of other things like how you give advice to your, your, your kids, for example, who are struggling in school. You want them to have more opportunities because they have done well in school. That's in the far right column. And so in order to, uh, you know, you do well in school, that's in the far left column. You want to make sure that they, um, you know, know how to study, that they get a right, the right amount of sleep. They um, can hear the teacher. They can see what's what's written on the chalkboard or, or whatever, you know. So it really, you know, take any kind of goal you have, any kind of quandary, you can find a correlation to this metaphor in these three columns. And by doing that, everyone's happy. <laughs> we have not only happy employees, but happy customers and happy shareholders. So this is the recipe that I think we need to be pursuing. It's not necessarily starting with employees and what makes them happy and assuming that that's going to make customers happy and then make shareholders happy. It's the other way around. We need to take a look at which employee groups, customer groups, and partner groups will provide the rewards that we need because they are high potential in terms of what they're bringing to the party. Then find out what's important to them, focus on that, and make sure that what we're doing in employee experience is supportive of that 100%. Then the tactics that you bring in, such as dry cleaning services and such, you know, it's all ancillary, but the core has to be there. And as, if it is, you will see that it's not a chicken, the egg quandary. It really is, is something that you can control and align. So just in closing, I want to say that uh, experienced leadership is a team sport. It really requires everyone, not just the customer facing people, the employee facing people, the partner facing people. It inquire, requires everyone to know their role and to pull together a snafu in safety, a, a, a gap in facilities, a, a misstep with legal, a, something with accounting. Any party within the ecosystem of your company can cause uh, problems for employee experience, customer experience, or partner experience. And so it's really best to educate them about that intended outcome, the, the, the high potentials, and to make that the North Star of every single group in your company. How do you do that? Well, take a look at our free advice on the employee experience playbook, partner experience playbook, customer experience playbook, and marketing operations maturity playbook on clearaction.com. Attend my class on Fridays. It's starting here in about a half hour. Uh, every Friday, I have a 90 minute class for uh, executives and experts specifically. Experts meaning authors, keynoters, judges, thought leaders, uh, certified and longtime practice, practitioners or professionals of customer experience, employee experience, and partner experience. So uh, you'll learn a lot more in this class. It's chock full of things like this, but you can uh, complete it in the self-paced version in seven and a half hours. Um, it's likewise, we have very similar uh, content in our CCXP course. So if you're looking for certification or you're a beginner, a uh, manager, an analyst, um, a designer, you might really benefit from our CCXP course, whether you're going for certification or not, you'll find these pearls of wisdom throughout. And finally, all of the above is available in our uh, experience value exchange. You'll be able to work toward uh, badges for customer-centered action, enterprise use of insights, 
lifetime value mindset, motivated, uh, aligned motivations, consistency to intentions, and um, respecting interdependencies. So the last three there are really about ease of work. And the first three that I mentioned are about ease of doing business. So you can get your whole department on par with excellence in these areas, being able to drive the uh, adoption, uh, what I call absorption, adoption, and, and uh, application of customer insights by all functional areas in your enterprise. So join me next week for another round of experienced leadership. I'm really glad to have you here today and um, uh, look forward to seeing you next time.